Long before I saw America, I smelt it. The scent drifted through the door of our Moscow apartment, followed moments later by my father. He came into the living room and opened his suitcase. Hundreds of bars of soap in pristine wrapping spilled out. The kind of soap that you could never buy in Soviet Union, but was freely provided in the hotels across America. And my father had systematically stockpiled it from his rooms in New York, in Boston, and Philadelphia. I was eight years old then, but standing here today, I can still smell that soap. I cannot identify the scent, only that it was the scent of a new world. Suddenly, there in our small apartment was America. This was 1969, and America has just touched the moon. Along with that scent came a sensation, an expansion of horizon that would one day bring me here to Wharton School and the future full of opportunity. Thank you, Dean Garrett, members of the board, and the STEAM faculty. It's a great honor to be invited back to Wharton, America's first business school, to speak at such a significant occasion in this historic arena. Congratulations to everybody who is graduating today. At this moment, you are at the top of the mountain. It's been a hard climb, but you made it. Now, like anybody who has reached a peak, you face the big question, what lies in front of me? I never reached the peak where you stand today. I had to leave Wharton 25 years ago with the last slope still to climb. At the time, that was a sad moment. But in Silicon Valley, where I live now, dropping out has become kind of cool. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, who dropped out of Harvard, is giving commencement speech there in a couple of weeks. And Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Larry Page, Sergey Brin all dropped out. Some say that schools are taking a risk, giving a platform to drop out. But they are smart about it. They only invite us when it's too late for you to copy us. <laughs> and they also don't let us speak to freshmen. <laughs> so if you accept one idea from a Wharton dropout, it is this. While you are here at this summit, look a little further than what's right in front of you. Whatever you decide to do next, what matters most is looking beyond the horizon. The man who founded this university could see unusually far. On November 21st, 1783, Benjamin Franklin watched as the first manned air balloon rose from the ground. A skeptic in the crowd called out, what is the use of it? And Franklin is said to have replied, what is the use of a newborn child? He had a vision of humanity, not as it was, but as it could be. And he understood that from each new height, a new horizon come into view. This vision led Franklin to found many different kinds of enterprise, businesses, nonprofits, a pretty successful republic, and the first university. He also founded the modern scientific study of electricity. In his day, the strange new force was little more than a curiosity. But Franklin, again, was looking beyond the horizon. The ideas that sparked in his mind have now, have now lit up our planet. Science was my first passion. And scientists like Franklin are still my heroes. For a while, I tried to become one. But it was tough going. At the end of 80s, the Soviet economy started to collapse. I was working two jobs to pay the rent. As well as doing my PhD in physics, I was driving a car around Moscow selling gray market computers out of a trunk. I like to think my little startup was the Uber of its day, <laughs> combining cars, IT, and a disruptive approach to local regulations. A little too disruptive for my father, 
He was an economist focusing on capitalist business practices. As you can imagine, in a communist country, that was kind of a niche specialty. So he told me if I wanted to learn about business, I had to start looking beyond my horizon, at least as far as America. That, however, was easier said than done. Through a friend, my father managed to get me an interview here at Wharton. But for me, physically getting through the Iron Curtain was challenging. And then a miracle happened. Enter Michael Brin, a math professor at the University of Maryland. He had a talent for looking beyond the horizon, a talent he clearly passed on to his son, Sergey, who would go on to co-found Google. Michael Brin wanted scientists to be able to collaborate across political divides, and he had successfully arranged for a group of Soviet math students to visit America. Somehow, I was granted permission to accompany them as a kind of shepherd to make sure that they returned to the fold at the end of the trip. Of course, within minutes of arriving at our dorm, I abandoned my flock to Michael's supervision and headed straight to Wharton. The man who interviewed me, John Enyard, the director of MBA admissions at the time, is sitting right there. <laughs> to my great luck, he did not kick me out of his office because my application was a long shot and not just in terms of distance. To begin with, I did not have uh, pretty much any qualifications. I just dropped out of my PhD. And by the way, you need to work pretty hard to drop out twice. <laughs> and I certainly didn't have $29,000 a year in tuition and expenses. And until that year, no Soviet student had ever been granted a place at an American business school. But John saw beyond the narrow horizons of the Cold War. He could envision a world in which students from any country had the opportunity to study in the United States, absorb its ideas and values, and perhaps one day give something back. Today that sounds obvious, or at least it should. At the time, however, it was far-sighted and it changed my life. John, I will always be grateful to you. Most of the better decisions I've made in my career came from trying to look beyond the horizon. The first was in the 90s, betting everything on the internet. I believed it would be one of the most profound advances for civilization since electricity. Thanks to a lesson I learned at Wharton and to my early efforts as a computer salesman, over the next 10 years, I built one of the biggest internet startups in Europe. Then I founded DST Global, an investment firm targeting internet companies worldwide. In 2009, I heard about the unique opportunity to invest in Facebook. And by opportunity, I mean I flew from Moscow to Silicon Valley and refused to go back until the CFO gave me a few minutes in Starbucks where I convinced him to introduce me to Mark Zuckerberg. Eventually, we came in with a bid that most investors consider, to put it mildly, completely insane. But our secret was simple. Our team had been tracking every kind of social network globally, assessing not just their performance in the present, but their vision of the future. Already back then, it was clear that Mark Zuckerberg was looking beyond the horizon, putting Facebook on a path to become one of the world's most important institutions. The future, of course, is always uncertain. So to invest in the future, you need to be prepared to take risks and fail, but hold your focus. Along the peaks and valleys in front of you, the next quarter, the next year, the next economic cycle, your fortunes may rise and fall, but what matters is what lies beyond the horizon. In 2001, my fortunes fell a pretty long way. The internet company I founded lost 97% of its value. 
that definitely counts as a valley. In fact, as losses go, I thought it was pretty hard to beat. But a couple of weeks ago, I was having dinner with Masa-san, the founder of SoftBank. When I told him this story, he looked down on me and smiled. It turns out that just before that 2001 crash, he had become the world's richest person. Remarkably, his top ranking lasted three days. And then SoftBank value failed 99%. And he personally lost $70 billion. When you're trying to get back up from the bottom of the valley, it sometimes feels like you're on a treadmill. But it was then, and literally on the treadmill, in the gym, that I first saw Julia, who would become my wife. And 15 years and three daughters later, she is with me today. And if So eventually, things worked out OK. I ended up building a multi-billion dollar business, and SoftBank is hitting ever greater heights. Over time, risks do pay off, and predictions that seem very optimistic can hold true. After all, when I was a student, if someone had predicted that in 25 years, another Wharton grad would launch a serious private sector mission to settle Mars, we would have laughed at them. But then Elon Musk came along with his bold vision, and this is now the world we live in. In another 25 years, one of you, or maybe one of your classmates who dropped out, could be standing right here congratulating the class of 2042 on their graduation. What will the world look like? Will we have beaten cancer, built AI, found life beyond our planet? Well, Benjamin Franklin could see much further ahead than 25 years. In a letter to a friend in 1788, he wrote, it's some, I, I, I have sometimes wished it had been my destiny to be born two or three centuries hence, for invention and improvement are prolific, and the present progress is rapid. Many inventions of great importance, now unthought of, will be procured. We may then be able to avoid diseases and live along, as long as the patriarchs in Genesis. Well, we are not there yet, but we have a century to prove him right. And Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chen are betting on precisely that. They are donating billions of dollars to cure all human diseases by the end of this century. Four years ago, I joined with them, as well as Sergey Brin, and Anne Wojcicki to found the Breakthrough Prize, the world's biggest award for fundamental science and mathematics. We believe these are the best tools we have for understanding the universe and advancing our civilization. And we would like to see the superstars of science to be celebrated and compensated like other leaders of our culture, the great artists, entertainers, and entrepreneurs. Then last year, Mark joined with me and Stephen Hawking to launch Breakthrough Starshot, the first practical attempt to reach another star. We are betting that this century, technological innovation and the magic of Moore's law will allow a laser-powered spacecraft the size of a microchip to accelerate to 100 million miles an hour. This venture is personal. My mother never got to attend graduation, at least until today. And by the way, <laughs> let's, thank you. And by the way, let's have again a round of applause for all the mothers here today. So my mother was there, though, at my naming ceremony, where she called me Yuri, inspired by Yuri Gagarin, the first human being to enter space. It was in 1961, the year I was born. That was the moment when 
the horizon we could see with our own eyes literally expanded beyond our planet. As Franklin understood, the higher we go, the wider our horizons become, and the bigger the challenge of looking beyond them. Breakthrough Starshot, if it succeeds, could set our horizon at the interstellar scale. And by the way, Joseph Wharton, the founder of this school, among his other talents, was interested in measuring the distance to the stars. But ultimately, according to science, there is one horizon we can never look beyond. That is so-called cosmic event horizon. What lies beyond is forever outside our vision. Still, it's pretty far away, around 15 billion light years. So we'll have plenty of room to grow. In the next 25 years, you will be able to launch more ambitious project than my generation ever could. New ideas for industry, commerce, communication, government, and philanthropy, as well as science and technology will emerge. Now, when you are standing on your peak, this is your moment to look beyond the horizon. Already Yuri Gagarin, looking down on our planet, even the tallest mountain seems small. Today, your thoughts are on the future, but your future is far bigger than your own trajectory through life. You are part of this astonishing journey the progress of civilization in the universe. Back when that first hot air balloon was rising, humanity itself was a newborn baby. Thanks to people like Franklin, we opened our eyes for the first time. Since then, we have been learning, learning to stand, learning to walk, learning to think and talk and share. And so, class of 2017. Today is your graduation day, but one day, whether in 25 years or 250, we will graduate as a civilization. And your job is to lead us along that path. Your job is to be people of vision. Your job is to help all of us as a civilization to look beyond the horizon. Thank you.